Hey everyone, welcome back to the layout once again. As you can see, we've got some pretty cool scenery additions as well as some details. So let's get into it and talk about what's different since the last layout update. Alright, so the star of this update is of course going to be snowshed number five that you see right here. So this is a structure that I just recently completed. I built it entirely out of balsa wood with the exception of the concrete backing there, um, or the shed foundation that is made out of cardboard. It's covered in a bit of 3M patch plus primer, which is now called uh, small hole repair, I think. It's kind of a foamy plaster. I painted the, the concrete then in some cheap acrylics uh, to create that look. And then the, um, the concrete feet here on the posts, or at the base of the posts, those are made out of pink insulation foam that again are just painted with some uh, acrylic. So uh, same deal with the structure itself. This uh, was stained with a dark acrylic wash that I just mixed up. Um, but yeah, pretty simple. Um, I basically just looked at photos and had to do a bit of test fitting to make sure that the measurements were all correct, but then it's just a lot of repetition. So I cut a bunch of these um, posts. These are 1 8 inch by 1 8 inch uh, balsa dowels, square balsa dowels. And then um, you'll see at the top of those, I also have some shims and then connector pieces between the posts and the head blocks. Those uh, shims, those thinner pieces on the front as well, are 1 16th inch by 1 8th inch um, balsa dowels. And then the uh, cap timbers that you see there that head across the top of all of the posts are just two of those 1 8th inch um, square dowels stacked on top of each other. So, and then I should mention too that the roof, you can see those are all individual pieces as well. Uh, and those are the same dimension, oops, I just screwed up the sign, uh, same dimension as the posts too. So I labeled this shed number five on my layout. Um, it is inspired by a number of snow sheds on the line. It looks more like some, less like others, and I just generally tried to detail it to look uh, largely accurate. So there are some things that are going to be different from shed number five, um, but it, I think it still looks pretty uh, accurate, I guess, or it's it's in place on the layout. Um, looking at this end here, you'll see that there are some cool details I've added. So you'll see on the inside of the shed, there is a wire running the length of the shed, and then that heads up over the top, and then also connects to a little conduit box or junction box down here at the bottom um, that was from a Walther's kit. The wire itself is uh, Berkshire Junction, excuse me, Berkshire Junction um, Easy Line. This is the heavy Easy Line in the black color. And then the signs that you'll see on the posts here, uh, again, inspired from prototype photos. Those uh, I just made on Adobe Illustrator, but could easily also be done on like um, Google, uh, what's it, Google Docs or Microsoft Word. Um, and then I just printed those out with like an inkjet jet printer. Um, and then for the signs that have exposed backs, I actually pressed the paper into some 3M metal tape so that you can simulate the, the metal backing. So these signs, as you saw a clip ago, I accidentally bent one of these because they are basically metal. So the, the paper on the front, but the back is aluminum. Um, from self-adhesive 3M metal tape. Let's see again, there is the identifying shed number five sign. And here's a good angle. You can kind of look inside the shed and see that uh, wire back there. And if we head to this end of the shed, sort of similar details, same signage. We've got Shed five at milepost 1205.2, there's a no trespassing sign. Um, same sort of shed five, different style milepost marker there. And then on this end, you can see where the wire connects to that conduit box.
Here again is a look at the details on this end of the shed that are identical to the other side, um, minus a, a small difference in the uh, the wire conduit down here, which has to be, um, or doesn't have to be, it should be on the, the end on both sides, but there's not room on the other side, which is why it's on the inside of the shed. Um, but it's a little different down here on this end. And then if we continue here to basically control point Blacktail East, I've also started to work up a few other details here. I'll just say right now before I cover those details that there are a few things I still want to add, namely uh, a PTC antenna, which I actually have. I just haven't installed it yet. Um, I also have switch heater and motor details that I need to build and install on the switch points there. I also, per the prototype, I will install a uh, rock fence back there on the back side of that turnout using um, actually a different type of Berkshire Junction Easy Line. So as I mentioned, the conduit on the inside of the snow shed there, that is the heavy uh, black wire. And this, I ordered the fine Easy Line in white to basically simulate like the, the silver, silver looking wire that you would see um, on a rock fence. Just like I did the signage on the shed, um, I created a couple of NCTC signs for each of the signals here because once we head past this control point, at least with the current um, signaling setup, this becomes restricted limits up to the top of the grade at Marias. So we have, for the time being, until I get signals up there, this is end CTC territory there. And then we've got uh, the East Blacktail signage on the equipment box. This will get more details. I'm gonna put a ballast sort of bed underneath this. I'm gonna trim those legs a bit lower. There's some conduits that go from the middle of the bottom of the box into the ground, so I wanna model that. And then there's some cool signage over here too that are individually on posts. So we've got um, speed restriction signs. So as we head up, head up here to res uh, restricted limits, excuse me, you can see that for both passenger and freight, the speed limit becomes 20 miles per hour. And then going the other direction, you'll see we have begin CTC to head down the grade through the shed district. And with that, we get a slight increase in speed. So because of the grade and the tight curvature, um, like on the prototype, at least for sections of the grade, the uh, speed limit for freight trains is 25 miles per hour. So still pretty restricted. Um, but not far off from the prototype. So this perspective here is heavily inspired from uh, a prototype photo that I am very fond of, and you can kind of see the, uh, the similarity in perspective there. And then I almost forgot that we've got uh, a milepost sign here. So here's a milepost, um, which is not necessarily accurate to the prototype, but it is a milepost that is scaled to my layout, and we'll talk about that a bit more now. Okay, I will not dwell on this too much because it's no fun to talk about something that isn't actually complete, but I did want to show you, um, this is an idea that I introduced last time, but I've updated it slightly. Um, I have some face, fascia signage, excuse me, that I'm going to add around the layout. Um, I think the most, one of the more useful things will be regularly spaced mileposts. So these will be placed around the layout. Um, every 160 inches will be a milepost. And uh, then these are just sort of updates that I'll be adding to fascia signage that already had a milepost, which of course has now changed because I've been changing my uh, scale mile system. Um, there's some other identifying features, some, you know, transitions between one style of, of control versus another. But I think over here, this will be kind of cool. Um, I'll have the speed restrictions posted on the layout, as well as where the gradient changes and roughly what percent grade uh, you're dealing with. And um, I don't know, I just think this is something that'll be kind of cool for either a more experienced operator or someone who wants a, a bit more of a challenge uh, when you're running a road freight, um, because it can be sort of point to point, um, but I try to program my locomotives so that, uh, you know, you actually have to think about train handling. We do use distributed power on the layout, 
Um, so adhering to speed restrictions as well as understanding where your train is on the grade can add just a bit of complexity that I think makes running a road freight uh, a bit more enjoyable. And so I will put that fascia signage around the layout. Uh, once I get another layer of black paint on here, you'll see there's some paint scars from when I was doing scenery, so that needs to get cleaned up. And so when this gets repainted with another layer of black paint, I will then put the fascia signage up. And then one of the final paint things I need to do is the inside of the lighting valence. Um, it's probably bugging other people because it bugs me, but I do intend to paint that with our sky color. All right, one of the final operating tidbits that I've uh, sort of tweaked for my layout is the addition of weight to the coal train. And this is something that I mentally labored over for some time because it does bother me that there really are no bulk unit trains that head up the grade, at least on the western slope of Marias Pass. Um, in other words, there are no bulk unit trains that are loaded eastbound. Um, and because of that, usually when you have unit trains like grain, oil, whatever, heading up the grade, they don't need helpers to get up the grade. And to me, that's kind of boring. Um, helpers are required sometimes for mixed freights and, and for long intermodals and things like that. Um, but I like the idea of a big, heavy unit train. And so uh, while these coal loads are removable, um, it doesn't really fit into my operating scheme. And so for a while, I've just kind of been running the coal train with the, the simulated loads always in. But it's A, rare to get any coal train empty or loaded over Marias Pass, and almost never would a loaded coal train head eastbound over Marias Pass. But I did some extreme mental gymnastics, and I think I came up with a, a unlikely but possible scenario where you could get a loaded coal train heading up the grade. And now that I've justified it to myself, I have... Uh, I have decided to sort of make it operationally interesting. So to differentiate this train um, that heads up the grade loaded from the, the other trains that are empty, like the grain train and oil train, I have added a lot of weight to these cars. And so each of these cars on its own out of the box is about four and a half ounces. They now weigh nine ounces. So basically twice what they did. And it takes four very capable locomotives three on the head end and one on the rear to actually get this train um, up the grade. And again, that's just one of those things that I think adds a bit of interest uh, and variety to the road freights so that when we have an operating session, not every train is the same. Um, this is in a different distributed power configuration. It's three by one versus the, the two by one or three by zero um, power configurations that you might see on other trains. And on top of that, it is very, very heavy, and as such, it handles differently. And so that fascia signage that I was showing you will come into play, where for this train, you will really have to think about um, how much power is required on the rear end as, as the train crests the grade and, and things of that nature. So um, I'll explain probably in another video exactly what the mental gymnastics are that allow this train, in my mind, to run loaded eastbound. Um, but I now have it set up so that this very heavy train, which is literally very heavy even for the model, um, is loaded in the eastbound direction and westbound direction when it descends the grade.